Jared Anderson, welcome to Mormon Discussion Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you, Bill? Good, good. Excellent, excellent. Glad to have this chance to sit down with you and to talk. It's it's actually really exciting for me because um, I went part-time January 1st. So I only worked three days a week at the pawn shop, and now I'm going to get to for uh, a lot a lot more time spent uh, creating content for the various podcasts that I work on. And and this one, um, we might end up uh, duplicating on the Almost Awakened podcast as well, because there's going to be a lot of this information that'll, I think, pertain to that audience. But first off, um, I know you a little bit, but n- the folks who are listening right now aren't going to know you. So maybe share a little bit of a brief bio about yourself and kind of give people a feel for who you are. Yeah. Well, I think we're going to go back into my story a little bit. So I'll just talk about who I am currently. <laughs> um so my name is Jared Anderson. Uh, I'm a life coach. I do a bunch of uh, work in the transformational space. So I work a lot with Mormon men who've, who've left the church, similar to me. Um, was raised Mormon. Uh, I grew up born in Pittsburgh, raised in Oklahoma. Uh, we, <laughs> we moved to Utah under interesting circumstances. My mom, she uncovered this we'll call it nefarious kind of skeevy plot in, in Oklahoma with the Bishop and the stake president. And we actually had to like leave in the middle of the night because of threats. So we basically moved. Yeah. We moved to Utah when I was about 13, right after school ended. Um, it's, it's not a story applicable here, but it's an interesting story. Um, so yeah, was in the church, um, was a TBM for sure. Like, until about age 19. And that's when I left the church. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, get us started. Tell us, uh, maybe start us at the beginning where you want to kind of help us uh, begin to put context to some of the things you want to share and, and uh, let's go from there. Great. Um, <clears throat> normal high school kid, uh, pretty good kid, not nothing crazy, nothing too bad. Your normal, your normal teenage recalcitrance. But besides that, you know, I was a pretty good Mormon kid and I was very much a believing Mormon. Um, uh, yeah. So I fell in love with my high school girlfriend is the simple kind of, yeah, I fell in love with my high school girlfriend, Um, and we lose our virginity to each other. Uh, the way I like to describe it is our biology was stronger than our faith. <clears throat> and I had fairly strong faith, but Biology is pretty strong. So there was a whole thing that happens. You know, you you go to second base, you break up, and you're like, we got to stop. And you get back together because you, you're in love. <clears throat> so I, uh, I get a phone call one day, and it's basically like, hey, Jared, I'm pregnant. My dad is taking me away. So I got a phone call that she was pregnant and now she was leaving, Um, which left me scared, (laughs) to put it mildly. I was quite terrified. I had all of the faculties of an 18-year-old boy uh, to deal with this new situation, so I had no faculties, (laughs) basically. Um, What I basically did is, is I retreated into my basement bedroom for that time. I had no contact with her. She was gone. I had no communication. I didn't know anything about where she was or what was happening. So all that I had to rely on was the idea of faith. And uh, I just kept repeating to myself for months, just have faith and everything will work out. And what that meant to me was she would come back, we would get married and have our baby and live a good Mormon life. Um, I couldn't go on a mission any longer, but that wouldn't me- exclude me from faithful membership, basically, even though I had this large issue that is a big red stain on my chest, you could say. Yeah. So <clears throat> I get a phone call about seven months later after repeating my mantra although at the time I had no idea what a mantra was. Um, After repeatedly saying to myself, just have faith, I I believed it. I really did believe it, that this was what was going to happen. So she calls me and 
It's first time I'd heard from her. So I rush over to her house. So excited. And I'm like, this is the time we're getting back together. Upon which she informs me she's giving the baby away for adoption and there's nothing I can say or do to change her mind. And we're done. We're over. <clears throat> so I left her house just crushed. Um, absolutely devastated. Yeah, I can imagine. So I, I couldn't see the road. I was crying too much. I pulled over to the side of the road and... Um, I said the most beautiful thing I've ever said in my life. Can I swear on this podcast? I'm not sure. Oh, absolutely. So I said a prayer, which as all of us Mormon audience know, is <laughs> not the normal prayer. I said, God, faith just fucked me. Upon which I had a, the most profound mystical experience. And God was like, yeah, it totally did. And I said, what am I supposed to do now? And uh, God basically said, well, you need to leave the Mormon church and everything that you've ever learned, you need to relearn. And <laughs> such an overwhelming experience. There, there's no arguing. It, it's sort of like there, there, it, it didn't feel like a choice. It felt like I was walking this way walking this way in life. And then that happened. And I just turned left. I was walking North and then East, you know, it's just like, I, yeah. yeah. So, mm. so I was a Mormon one day and the next I was not, and it was disorienting. It was, it, it just didn't make any sense. It was really quite hard. And had I, Mormonism worked for you up to that point? Like, sure. Yeah. yeah, I loved it. I loved mutual and the Boy Scouts and being with my friends in the church. And I, I loved, gave me a structure and a framework. Mm -hmm. uh, I loved the community aspect and all of it. Mm. So it was working and then it didn't. <clears throat> um, it was interesting because I, I moved out of my parents' house about two weeks after that, that incident and my friend who I'm still quite good friends with, uh, he, we were moving in together and he was walking in and he just dropped a book of Buddhism in my lap. So this, this thing of, you have to relearn everything started at that moment. I read that book. I still remember it going to pieces without fi falling apart by Brian Epstein. Mm. And I just started voraciously consuming and the, I, I found Alan Watts pretty early on, and I became a yeah. big fan of Alan Watts. Love Alan Watts. Back in the day. And I just yeah. started, like, got into mysticism. Mysticism was the thing that always really stood out to me, and I loved reading the mystics. So the East, you know, mostly the Eastern mystics really, really stood out. And um, that's how I left the church. So... Yeah, I'll tell you, that's... It's interesting, because you're, you're young when this happens, right? You're... Oh. She was, she got pregnant when I was 18 and then that happened when I was 19. Yeah. I mean, 19 years old and to be taking Alan Watts seriously <laughs> is, is pretty impressive because I was, um, introduced to some of that stuff along the way in my journey, but I didn't really dig in and go, man, there's some real deep nuggets of, of truth and uh, a better way to live a life until I was probably 35 years old. And so it, it impresses me that you saw this stuff as viable much earlier in life. And, and so anyway, I just want to make note of that. Um, where does it take you from there? Um, I had to deal with the trauma of having a baby stolen from me. Yeah. Um, after she informed me she was giving the baby away, remove contact again. And, and basically her family, which is a very wealthy, like – powerful in a sense, Mormon family hid her. Um, mm. so I, <clears throat> the, the interesting story. I was, I had just started at, um, UVSC at the time and her black sheep brother-in-law, the one black sheep found me at, at school. We, we, crazily just passed each other. I'd never seen him before. I knew who he was, but I'd never seen him. And we passed each other in the hall. And he was like, hey, she's in labor today. 
And I, again, I was like, I, I, I wasn't allowed any say or anything at all. So I actually rushed over to the hospital and they had her hidden under a different name and kept mm. her away. And mm. I literally just went up and down the hospital looking, looking like I was pretty desperate and I didn't know anything about trauma. I didn't know anything about how those wounds were affecting me. So I just basically spent the next few years in a state of more or less like post-traumatic stress where mm. I was angry. I was really angry at Mormons and I did a, the way I was with Mormons for pretty much like the most of my twenties, I am not proud of, I would mm. just be angry. And I was learning a lot, a lot about the church at the time. And so I would just go after their faith in a way that was really cutting mm. and I would go for the jugular and mm. that's a symptom of me being hurt. And I, you know, I have a lot of compassion for that guy. He was really hurting. And so I don't, I don't blame myself a lot, but I do wish that I would have had the wisdom and the teachers and the community to support me to like have chosen differently and to actually give me, to give me um, practices and ways that I could move through my trauma in a healthier way. Cause I didn't, I didn't deal with it very healthily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man, I'm trying to, to sit with that for a moment. I mean, first off, I mean, un, un, somewhat of a tangent, but you know, this idea that once you've gotten someone pregnant and, and they're going to have a kid, you can't go on a mission. And, um, you know, Mormonism does this thing where if you, if you have some kind of outward mistake, it kind of crosses you off from being or doing certain things. And, there's so many boxes to check that all of us walk around feeling the shame and guilt, but, but then you have this traumatic life event happen and, and essentially you let go of Mormonism. You're trying to do the right thing, put those pieces back together. And obviously it sounds like you wanted to be a dad and you were willing to, to marry this girl and you felt like you were in love. And so you, you know, Hey, you know, worse, worse things have happened than getting somebody pregnant as a, as a young adult or a, an old teenager. And, yeah. And doing the right thing and raising a family, right? Like, yeah, that had to have been hard, my friend. It was. Yeah, for sure it was. And this notion of image is, is plays a big role in the, in the conversation, in my story. I mean, her, she, the reason she was taken away is for the image. <laughs> we can't yeah. have a teenage daughter who's pregnant. We're going to hide her away yeah. so we can maintain the image of this um, of this good Mormon family and the external quote unquote mistake. It, it's, you know, I think Mormon Mormonism, it has a lot of gifts and beautiful aspects to the religion, but it's a little too vain. Um, and it needs to really, I wish it would have a reckoning with its vanity. <clears throat> yeah, that's that's going to be hard to do because those top 15 guys don't really want to do that. And no. they really have to take the lead or it never happens. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So you're carrying around all this pain. And uh, but at the same time, you're kind of catching on to, I, I want to say, wisdom traditions. Yeah. Buddhism. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Buddhism. It's a big part of the Almost Awakened podcast that I do. Um, but again, you're also you're also hurting. And uh, I'm curious how you navigate those two things juxtaposed against each other. Yeah. You know, it's interesting you talk about, uh, as you were paying me the compliment about Alan Watts, I had no idea what he was saying, but I felt compelled to listen to those lectures and read those books like over and over. So it was, it was this weird thing where I was like, I don't know what the hell he's talking about, but I'm going to keep listening. And so I just kept coming back and it was this something inside of me that that experience that I had with the divine, which was like, you have to relearn everything just pushed me into this realm of mysticism. So while I was dealing with trauma, you know, I, I didn't know of any communities and I just started doing a bunch of psychedelics with a bunch of hippies. And that was the closest thing I had to a community. 
And so people would eat mushrooms and, and I would eat mine and then they would go party and I would just leave the party and go meditate for like seven hours. I would just sit, sit in Zazen and just go on these crazy trips. And that's sort of how I did it for a long, that was like my 20s. So I had pretty profound experiences that kept happening to me. But in a sense, it was quite dangerous because I didn't have a way to contextualize or contain those experiences. I didn't know, I didn't have a community to support me with playing with this powerful inner technology. And um, I was very cavalier about the way I went about it, but I didn't know how else to do it. Um, but that all started to change when I was about 27 and I first started reading Ken Wilber. And when I started reading Ken Wilber, are you familiar with Ken Wilber? Spiral dynamic, <laughs> Dynamics, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Huge fan, by the way, of that as well. So that's another <laughs> thing. When when we were prepping for this conversation, I just knew that we would be able to talk about ground that we both kind of had traveled and understood. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Ken Wilber. Uh, yeah, he, he changed my life just by reading his work. And I, um, for the first time in my life, it allowed me to start to heal as well as forgive Mormons in the Mormon church where I didn't need to go around and attack. It allowed me to actually fall back in love with them. It was a longer process, but it was the, he does a lot of mapping of consciousness. And when I could contextualize what the Mormons professed, how their religion was presenting, how most of them were presenting, I could for the first time start to see, um, I could see their humanity again. And, um, yeah, it was a beautiful experience. It was, it's, I, I even get a little tender. I noticed right now and just with my appreciation for, for Ken and his writing and, um, and just for like having been guided in its sense, it feels like I was kind of pushed by who knows what my higher self, I don't know, into this place where I, you know, when the student is ready, the, the teacher arrives and it felt like I was ready for, for Wilbur at that time. I love it. Let me ask a couple of questions about psychedelics. And I also want to give people some context for Ken Wilbur. So um, in terms of psychedelics, I'm, I'm deeply interested in that facet. I tend to stay away from talking about my personal experiences because I, I feel like there's people ready to pounce on me if I talk about sure. what I've done or not done. Sure. But I do find that uh, altering your consciousness is a gigantic tool to becoming a second half of life adult, as Richard Rohr has, has called it. This idea that you let go of kind of your ethnocentricity, your, your ego to some extent, and you begin to realize that um, every other person in the world is you under a different set of circumstances, right? And, right. And – so whether it's things like ayahuasca, uh, mushrooms, LSD, uh, I've even heard people say to some extent cannabis uh, and other, other kinds of those tools really help you kind of see your life and what's going on in front of you through a different lens. It turns off certain parts of your brain, turns yeah. on other parts of your brain. Mm -hmm. And what you end up having is a completely different uh, lived experience during those that time, whether it's an hour or five hours or eight hours. And uh, I just I wanted to get your thoughts maybe as we kind of spend a few minutes talking a little deeper about that part of your journey as you begin to experiment with those tools. Sure. Um, what were some of the things that um, – because – and I'll say this too. I think when you use those things really young – it, it has the potential to be a completely different experience, almost maybe recreational. Yeah. And and at least um, the people that I hang around with now at the age I'm at, it seems like it really is understood as a tool and used that way almost entirely. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's still laughs and fun. But sure. Um, your thoughts on what that was to you then, and, and maybe also if we – can jump ahead a little bit if you've continued to use those things and what they've meant to you going forward. Yeah. Um, there's the outer universe that we look at stars and galaxies, etc. 
but there's also an inner universe and it's just as vast. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's the left-hand quadrants from Wilbur's four quadrant model. And it's, it's exploring consciousness basically. And consciousness in my opinion is as vast as the universe. It is the universe but it's the internal expression of the universe, the inside part of it. And you're born into this world where it seems like there's stuff and there's the way that society presents the world. And then you do psychedelics and you can laugh and it's fun. And I have no judgment about that at all. And I've done it in that way plenty of times. But if you bring that internal intention, the set and setting that's so much talked about, you will actually see that the universe is not as it presents mm -mm. on, you know, on TV or on like the not even TV. That's not a good because it can just as the world as it presents as we walk around in our in our quote unquote regular consciousness. So. As Wilbur would say, psychedelics are a state. They're a powerful state experience. And a state experience is a short, you know, ephemeral episode that shows you this. It, it's <laughs> you travel to another planet on this planet. It's just yeah. like the upside down world or something. And it just reveals you, you go one, one layer deep into the onion and then you do it again and you go two layers deep and then you keep realizing that the onion goes all the way down <clears throat> and you start yeah. to, yeah. Pe people who, um, people who have not used those tools are going to be like, what the heck's he talking about? And the people who have are going to be nodding their head up and down and smiling like me yeah. as you're saying that. And yeah. Um, Everything, as, as Alan Watts would say, everything's an illusion, right? Like it's all an sure, illusion. They're all sure. arbitrary constructs. The world could have been built a million different ways. And the systems that have survived and perpetuated have decided that this is the way the world is going to be built. And yet at any moment, at least in large chunks of that, you can step outside of that and choose to perceive, act, and organize your world in a completely different way. Yeah. It, yeah. it is powerful. Yeah. It's not just psychedelics. I mean, the wisdom traditions, mythology, stories, literature, <clears throat> Gilgamesh, all of these. It, this is not new. This is quite old to humanity. When <clears throat> Persephone was taken to the underworld, psychedelic journey. It doesn't. You don't need to take a substance. I mean, you can do this through breath work. But you, it's, it's, I love your comment because once you see it for the first time, there's a recognition. You've been to this planet before, you've been to this other world before, and now it opens you to possibilities of non regular or non ordinary consciousness. So yeah, yeah. they're powerful substances. They're not all good. It's not that it's all, there are risks with it. You know, there are risks. Amen. Yeah, amen. And I'm not suggesting at all that people just go out and cavalierly being like, yes, let's do this. I think that you need to have a powerful container before you go into them. And yeah, and I think you have to have some assurance of your own uh, mental stability. Absolutely. Right? Like there is certainly risk. I, I remember once saying to... Um, on the Almost Awakened podcast, I said that mushrooms are essentially completely safe, that you can't overdose, you're you're not gonna, you know, you're you're not gonna die doing those. And I had a father call me up the next day who said after his son had done mushrooms, his mental stability was deeply compromised. And he didn't sure. it took two or three years before his son, the the kid he you know, the the, the boy he had raised kind of came back. Absolutely. And and so yeah, I, I think we ought to at least put that little caveat in that for most people, it is safe and it is a significant way to process the world and to understand the world differently and to, I think, step into a better way of living a life. Yeah. And there is a small minority of people who can be adversely affected by these things. I just had a friend um, kill himself, uh, basically not on ayahuasca, 
but he he did a very extreme dieta, which for those who are, un, who are unfamiliar, you do a diet, you prepare for this experience for a long time. And he did a quite extreme dieta. So he was really, his body wasn't strong. It was pretty weak and he was very altered. And he did like, I think ceremony, like five or six nights in a row, something crazy. And he jumped off a waterfall afterwards. Um, not while he was on the substance, but he was just so, it's, it's hard because you take these substances in these other worlds, reveal themselves, and then you have one foot in those worlds and one foot in this world, and it's hard to navigate. Again, going back to mythology, you, there's this notion of crossing the threshold where you cross a threshold into these spaces. And so then you're in <clears throat> other worlds. And then the mythologies always have a moment where you cross out of the threshold back into this world. And he was navigating in like one foot there, one foot here, and it doesn't work because there's, there are, in these other worlds, you can't fly. Your consciousness is flying. You're experiencing things like that, but your physical body cannot fly, but yet it doesn't compute. And right. that's why it, you need a powerful setting to, and also a, a container to be like, yes, there you can fly here. You cannot. Right. And he jumped off a waterfall yeah. and it was quite tragic. Yeah. I'm glad we, I'm glad we had this part of the conversation. Cause I think anybody who's considering altering their consciousness with substances ought to think long and hard. Cause again, I think, I think 90, whatever, 98% sure. of people are fine and it will be a net positive. Um, and they'll refer to it as such, but there is a small percentage who are, are adversely affected and we all ought to be a little scared prior to jumping into those things. Agreed. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned Ken Wilber. I just want to give people a little bit of context. When I was deconstructing Mormonism, I was looking for wisdom. Like it's the first time in your life where you open yourself up to the authorities outside of your tribe. Right. Mm -hmm. And you say like, maybe there's other people out there who know things that my authorities don't know. And I'd like to investigate that. So it's when I found Alan Watts. It's when I found Ken Wilber, um, Richard Rohr, a thousand other people. And what I uh, what I learned early on was these these ideas of stages of faith, and how our mental cognition around belief concepts and what's true and what isn't, and what's wisdom and what isn't, as that starts to open up, um, I come across Ken Wilber, and it's this idea of spiral dynamics. And I just I want the I want the listener to understand what he what it is he's teaching. He basically takes things like. And, and he's not doing it directly. It's not like he goes and says, hey, I'm going to take James Fowler's stages of faith and I'm going to adapt them. Right. But but there's overlap with all of these, um, all of this research and data on how people's perception of the world and how they perceive themselves in it and how that develops. There's numerous people out there who go into that. What Ken did, for the listener, what Ken did was he really came up with what I think is the most expansive approach to um, to how our brains change and what that means for who we are as a human being. And the idea of spiral dynamics, if you can just picture a spiral listeners, you keep revisiting the same things over and over again as you go through the course of your life. You, you encounter different concepts that you had encountered before and you – thought about a new way and you adapted a little. And now three years later, you're right back into thinking about that thing again. And now you're in some new place. And so spiral dynamics is this idea that you're always changing, but you're also always kind of going over the old ground and adapting again. And um, he's written numerous books. There's numerous YouTube videos out there with him explaining uh, different concepts within his approach. But I thought he was the most in depth, most expansive of all of those kinds of um, theoretical work that that goes into human behavior around yeah. around how we adults change over time. Yeah, well said. Well yeah. said. I just want to make sure that the listeners kind of had a feel for who he was. Um, yeah. Go ahead and share a little more about Ken Wilber and your thoughts on him, and uh, we'll pick up there. 
the spiral dynamics um, was, you know, I ended up writing my master's thesis on basically spiral dynamics. Um, and um, the complexity and nuance that he has when he, because he synthesizes and aggregates basically all these intellectuals who are doing some really deep work. Uh, but this mapping of consciousness, this mapping of like egoic structures and how our egos progress, um, both on the individual as well as the collective levels, because you can see how our collective is progressing. That gave me a map um, to navigate through my own. Yeah, it gave me not only a map, but also a community to dive in to and with. So Ken is, yeah, he's he's an absolute genius. I mean, beyond genius level. He is an extraordinary intellect on this planet. Um, I think maybe what I want to do is mention Fowler's five stages of faith with the Mormon, um, you know, we're on a Mormon podcast. I think that the Mormon church is a great place for individuals at stages zero, one, two, and sometimes three. But the second somebody steps into stage four, the church has sort of antibodies that just kick you right out. And that's really sad for me. And I, one of the things that happens that, that Ken talks about with growth is that oftentimes the next stage of development, whether in its egoic stage or Fowler's stages, seems like regression. It seems like it's going backwards or the wrong path. And I'm, I'm sad that the church has this notion that stages four and five actually seem regressive. And they, they seem like, I, I, I guess all I'm saying is one of the things I'm a very big proponent for the church, I don't want the church to be destroyed. I want the church to have a reformation and to have more inclusion for a wider spectrum of faith expression and for religious expression. There we go. <clears throat> nice. You're muted. Hey, uh, Bill, can you hear me? Yeah, I was going to say stages of faith with Fowler this idea that, you know, when you say when you get to stage four, stage three is this very much belonging. You fit in. You pretend parts of yourself so that the tribe accepts you and you all signal to each other that you're doing the right thing. You're in the tribe. You belong. And stage four is really that first point where you start to test it. By the way, we're talking about follower stages of faith. Up on the screen is Ken Wilber's Spiral Dynamics, which I was hoping. Um, let's see if I can get a little more of that to fit. It may not. That's okay. Um, this idea of stage four is when you really start to sense that your tribe doesn't have all the answers. You want to try to help the tribe gather in more wisdom. You realize that there is truth outside of your belief system as well. And in this mode of being willing to speak up and to challenge things, you no longer fit in. And like you say, Mormonism very quickly tells you that enough's enough. Yeah. Um, it's not going to tolerate that. Yeah. yeah. The, I think one of the key learnings that helped me start to forgive Mormons was um, the idea of, of, of ethnocentric consciousness. Ethnocentric consciousness is group centric consciousness. And this is a healthy, natural way. I mean, we don't blame a three year old for being egocentric. That's what they should be. And that's, how we grow and we start to grow into group centric versions of consciousness. I am a part of my family. I am a part of my ward. I am a part of something. And we, we get, we orient into our tribe. We orient into groups. And as pack animals, that's so, uh, it, it's very important. The problem with ethnocentricity is that we, the, the vast majority of us get stuck there. And one of the key axioms of ethnocentric um, consciousness is my group is right 
and your group is wrong. So it's this right wrong context. When you jump into world centric consciousness or second tier consciousness, as Wilbur would describe, there's this radical transformation in consciousness, which states I'm still in a group. I will always be part of a group, but my group is right, but partial. And that means your group is right, but partial. So it moves from <clears throat> a right wrong context into everyone has a part of the truth. How can we navigate accepting your truths and the parts of you that are true and the parts of mine that are true? And where do we get to bring critical thinking to my own belief systems? And that really helped me, again, fall back in love with Mormons because I could see the truth that the church was offering. You're muted once again. So sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. So I want to put this back up. Um, just, to, you know, moving back into Ken Wilbur, just so people can kind of get a feel. You know, when you start off at the very bottom colors, I'll, I'll try to move my cursor. You can kind of see down there. When you start off at these bottom colors, you're you're in that very early stages of life where you're, you know, as a baby, for instance, you don't give a shit about who your mom or dad necessarily is. You just need your diaper changed. You only know what your needs are. You don't really care what other people's needs are. And as you get older, you are taught by your tribe, uh, by your family, by your community to value uh, other people and that we all have to compromise parts of ourselves in order to fit in. And as you develop through these colors or stages, you become more inclusive. You become more aware of truth outside your group. You become more aware that all of us are connected and to some extent, the very opposite, which is you are entirely alone. Um, both of those. Yeah. And what I think is the greatest part of any of these theoretical approaches, and I, I only call it that because that's the proper way to call it. I don't actually think it's theory. I think there's deep truth in these systems of understanding. But what they all do and what I think Spiral Dynamics does better than any of them is it gives you a very full map. And so while I was in a certain stage, um, I could start to sense that there were other stages because they were written about, talked about. Yeah. Um, I was told what changes would happen as I moved into the next stage. And so I could start to perceive those things as they were happening. The, the greatest thing that it did for me was it gave me the motivation to know that where I was wasn't the final landing place. Right. And that if I took learning and I took humanity seriously, I could speed up the process by which I moved into these stages, the understanding and comprehension I had of them, and it has deeply impacted how I see human behavior today. If I sit with a group of friends or strangers and I just sit and watch them interact, I pick up on so much more today that's going on in that conversation. Yeah. Um, it really is profound. It's, <clears throat> and it's interesting. You know, I've got a two-year-old grandson. He, he feels things, right? He's got feelings going on and he doesn't have any stories to those feelings. He doesn't, he barely has any words to those feelings. And here we are as adults and it's this really complex process that most parents have no clue about. They're just disciplining their kid when he does something wrong. They're praising him when he does something good and they're teaching it that way. But on this side of things, being a grandparent and understanding all of this stuff it gives me so many more tools to understand his anxiety, understand yeah. his uh, lack of ability to express himself, which causes frustration within him and, and leads me to be able to have better language to help him understand what's going on. Yeah. It, it's just such a fascinating thing. Anyway, I just I find all this <laughs> stuff to be just so super cool. I couldn't agree more. For those of you listening who have never – gotten into Ken Wilbur, proceed with caution. <laughs> Once you, if you catch the bug, say goodbye to the next year of your life. You yeah, yeah, yeah. dive you have no into free time. a hole. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, he, and also Alan, Alan Watts too, just a note, yeah. one of my favorite videos, I'm sure you've seen it multiple times, but uh, is it time, uh, ego, time, money, ego? Um, I, yeah. I overdid oh, Watts. My, 
I think that's a great introduction to him. There's a great video on YouTube where a graphic artist, uh, a sketch artist adds in all these drawings around what's being said. And it mm. just seems so connecting, but yeah. I would definitely, like you're saying, I would definitely recommend that people go out and, and check some of these voices out. Yeah. Uh, it will be life changing, but yes, goodbye to your free time. You'll be listening to things every morning on <laughs> yeah. your drive to work every evening on your way home. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, um, you know, if you're interested in this stuff, you're interested in this stuff and it becomes incredibly fascinating. Yeah. Um, it's really quite profound work. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned forgiving the church. I'm not there yet. And uh, I'm curious, I'm curious if you don't mind saying a little more about that because it's not eating me up anymore. I'm living my life. I'm enjoying my life. I'm grateful yeah. for some of the things it gave me. It's good and it's bad help me to be who I am today. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm grateful. I wouldn't change anything. If I can go back in time, I wouldn't not join the church. I would, I would let my younger self, let it all play out just the way it did. Yeah. But I also, I'm still angry and I'm still, yeah. I'm still pissed and I'm, I'm still going to try to find ways to help every single individual I can to get out of that thing. Um, would you mind saying a little more about that? The forgiveness? Absolutely. Yeah. Anger is an extremely common experience that people have as they're first leaving. And it can last one day, one week, one year, the rest of your life. And I know a lot of people that are in year 35 and are still quite angry. And there, I have no judgment yeah. about that at all. Yeah. Anger is a beautiful emotion when applied healthily. And anger, anger's prime directive is pay attention. Look at this. That's sort of like what anger always is saying. Look at this. And it's like demanding that you look at something. The key to anger is really staying grounded, allowing yourself to not get kicked off into like super sympathetic resonant, like a super fight or flight nervous system, but to stay as grounded as you can and to navigate and to as, as much as you can really sit with anger as your teacher of like, what are you pointing me to? And that's what I had to do with Mormonism is be so angry, but have it like have anger show me it has very little to do with the church, but it had to do with, that's not true. I was angry at the church. Um, One of my other teachers, you know, she mentions um, your your deepest wounds will become your greatest gifts mm. if you can do the work to, 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 to transverse that. I mean, look at you, Bill, like you are prolific in this space and you're doing some beautiful scholarship and a lot of work in terms of here's the history, here are the things that the church is doing, and maybe there's some hooks in there with some of that anger, but it's causing you to move and you're in your process of that. So with me, the anger is, it helped me to unlock this world of Ken Wilbur and Alan Watts and the mystics. And it really helped me to live this life that I consider to be incredibly rich and fulfilling. But the anger showed me that my pain and my trauma help to humble me to connect to other people's pain and trauma. Mm. And I think that was one of the biggest gifts is that it helped me um, attach to other people. Yeah. I, uh, I'll add to that. I think in part, my anger is tied to my own self-deception. And, and what I mean by that mm. is that the church mm. absolutely creates an environment that encourages you and pressures you to pretend to be what the tribe needs you to be. Yeah. But you're not an innocent party to that. You're, you're contributing to the deception, hence the self-deception. You are accepting answers that are less tenable. You are putting things on a shelf rather than acknowledging that something isn't right here. Mm. And the ability that one's brain has to accept less than satisfactory answers and to think they actually work 
isn't the isn't really the church's fault. It's the way our brains are designed to work, and it really is a personal issue. And the moment we go like, "Hey, I want to look at this rationally, logically. I want, I want the answers that have the least amount of conjecture and allowances, and I want um, to not give a free pass to the requirement to take a hundred less than satisfactory answers." and to absorb all of those and to just keep believing each of us is responsible. Uh, I just saw a quote yesterday that said, um, you are something to the effect of you are the only person who can wake you up. <laughs> and so um, yeah. isn't it right? Like you can't totally. reach out to anybody who's believing in nonsensical things. You can't take a flat earth guy and argue him out of a flat earth philosophy. He really has to discover it himself. And, when you realize that the discovering of the world more like it really is, is your own responsibility. Um, at least for me, I was able to put less of the blame on the church and accept some of that myself. Love. I love what you just said. So beautiful. And the word that stood out to me is responsibility. And so often in anger phases with the church, we place all of the responsibility on the church. Yeah. And I think that as we pull back some of that responsibility into us, that's where a lot of the healing can happen. You know, the responsibility, the ability to respond, right? More When we take more responsibility, we have more ability to respond to the situation. Rather than react. Right? Totally. Yeah. yeah. So it, when we can be in the coaching world that I come from, you know, more at cause versus more at the effect of something. And often when we first leave the church, we're at the effect of that. And it's all you, 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 F you church, you did this, blah, blah, blah. And I'm not to, I'm not trying to negate any of the responsibility that the church should take. And I would, I continually encourage the church and their leadership to take more responsibility, but that doesn't, abdicate our own sense of responsibility that we can take for yeah. our own lives. And I love what you said because yeah, the church does some <clears throat> insidious kinds of things. It does some, it, it does some gaslighty kinds of stuff, but what major organization doesn't Yeah, Go, the government Coca-Cola yeah. when they do ads on TV, I mean, <laughs> you know, Everybody's manipulating you. Sure. Everybody's trying to get you to buy their product, believe in their thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just a little note here before we move into kind of the next phase of the conversation. But, you know, you mentioned this idea of, of follower stages of faith and the church loves you when you're at stage three and it starts to really um, – try to convince you with messaging that something's wrong with you when you move into stage four. Yeah. So it, it takes this message that as you're growing and developing, it's trying to tell everyone around you that you're losing something. Right. And I just want to note kind of at ages. So to be at stage three, the rest of your life means you stagnated. You, you, you didn't keep growing and it's no offense. Again, I didn't wake up to, this stuff until I was around 30 years old. Um, the church would, the church loves you to grow up to about 15 or 16 years old. Yeah. And then it wants you to stay at a 15, 16, 17 year old mentality for the rest of your life. And as you move into your twenties and thirties and you start to realize the world doesn't work the way they, they told you, um, it doesn't really want you growing and changing and shifting. And it's to the point where, the system convinces everyone that stagnating and staying the same is faith and endurance and uh, testimony. And so there's really no healthy way to go, hey, I don't think the way I used to. I don't yeah. see the world the way I used to. And and when you do claim that, the church paints you as bad. I just want to note like the idea that that on some level, you're really not encouraged to adult in Mormonism yeah. and in a lot of systems for that matter. And as you pointed out to a lesser extent, things like the U S government aren't much better. Right. Yeah. It's to their own detriment. Yeah. They're punching themselves in their own face. Why? It's because they, I think that's all they can see. 
Yeah. They're not allowing for more space. I mean, they're losing membership. Like, like you do a, a lot of work in terms of the numbers and yes, it's a greater trend of people losing, you know, being the nuns N O N E in terms yeah. of their religion, but it's also, <clears throat> it's a product of like how the church is going about it. They don't make any space for this and they have a rigidity around this is the way it is. And the church was designed to grow and evolve and the way that they do it, they're trying to like, they're walking this interesting dance where they just, I have a lot of compassion for the church membership yeah. and the church leadership, because if I was in their position, if I was an apostle or the prophet, I would be terrified of all of it. And I wouldn't, I don't envy that position. Yeah. I want to, I want to add too. if we take individuation to its extreme, in other words, if we were to get the collective planet to move into stages, you know, follower stages of faith four five and you yeah. know, six and, you know, everybody took seriously Ken Wilber spiral dynamics that may end with the disintegration of society, right? Like, oh, yes. So, yes. so there is a negative, yes. <laughs> there is a negative in all of us individuating yeah. and recognizing that all of us collectively, the individual is more important than the system. Yeah. And so on some level, maybe it's best that 60 or 70% of us stay in stage three or less. Um, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that we want to live in that world either, if that makes sense. I think we're growing into a new species. I think humanity is in this moment where there's a new species that's emerging. And the system, as it spreads, and you have a wider... There was always been outliers, but as you're having more and more and more people, as there's these really dominant <clears throat> stages of consciousness, they're all competing with one another. And we've seen three major stages really competing in the U.S. where it's traditional, modern, and postmodern. And I don't know if the system's going to make it, but it can't. With the with the extremes of postmodernity rearing its head right now, if integral consciousness emerges as a major stage in the U.S., I I don't. That will be an interesting. I, I'm struggling because I'm like, how much do they know? Man, I'm wondering how much more context I need to bring, but the system has a harder time holding a larger array, a larger yeah. amount of struck of consciousness structures, basically. Yeah. And so in the past, it was basically traditional and modern. And what was so interesting to me is watching Trump. Trump actually has a lot of red consciousness and his dominant expression is red consciousness, which is a regression, not necessarily bad. There's some healthy expressions of red, but it actually, the system was kind of moving upward. It was modern, tra uh, traditional, modern and postmodern. And now it's almost like this warrior God. There's like four major parts because now Trump has given this new major voice to an even larger array of, of um, structures. And so it's fascinating to watch that because we always think that like development goes up, not down, but it, there's definitely a dissension as well <clears throat> in terms of uh, consciousness expansion. There was a lot there. <laughs> no, no, I'm, it's it's good. Like, um, yeah. I'm just gonna put something up here on this uh, on the screen. Let me get rid of the overlay here. So, when you say red, I mean you're talking egocentric, uh, vigilant, aggressive, impulsive, ruthless, courageous, determined, and powerful. Yeah, some of those are good traits. Some of those are bad traits. And we should note that every one of these stages comes with gifts and talents, as well as flaws and weaknesses. Yep, um, and often blind spots as well. And and as you move up through these stages, it starts with archaic being the lowest stage and working to post integral. And uh, and I don't know if this is the full scale, but this is at least the majority of stages that people can kind of comprehend and yeah. and work with. Um, 
Yeah, it's going to be interesting because I think what happened with Trump, the storming of the Capitol by those who deeply believed in him and his message, it really almost symbolizes this fight of as as we all change, there's a group that want to go back to being the same. Sure. And there is a group that says, no, we've got to keep growing. We've got to keep shifting and yeah. adapting. And those two ideologies are are at odds with each other. And it's going to be interesting because there has been research done on how long a society can last before it breaks down and something new comes up out of sure. it. Yeah. And the United States of America is on the back half of that conversation. Yeah. And some societies have lasted far longer. Some have lasted far shorter, but there is an average and, and the research has been done on that. And it's going to be interesting in another hundred years, 200 years, 300 years, what, because I, you and I grew up with like, Hey, this is the United States of America. And I just thought like, that's a thing yeah. and it is what it is. And we all understand it and we agree to it. And the reality is the United States of America today is not the United States of America of a decade ago. And it sure as hell isn't the United States of America of 1776 or whatever. Sure. Right. Yeah. So anyway, interesting stuff. I, this, this, um, <clears throat> there's always chaos. Uh, whenever there's a disintegration and you know how we move through these stages both as individuals and culture is that there's there's like a thesis statement of each stage so modernity's thesis statement is pull yourself up by your own bootstraps well the antithesis the antithesis is basically like well you say that how come only white men get to pull themselves up by their bootstraps so all of a sudden, post-modernity starts to emerge, and the thesis statement comes out of that tension between modernity's thesis and antithesis. And so that synthesis of post-modernity is everyone's included, right? The antithesis, in a lot of ways, of post-modernity is everyone's included but white males. It's just like the inverse, right? And it's not till we get to integral that there really is a place for everyone. And that there's a way to house that aggressive consciousness of the mythic gods, of this power warrior tribe, because that's not necessarily bad. And we have a lot of, I mean, the hero story of soldiers, that is an expression of healthy red, of sacrificing self for society, sacrificing self for others. But then there's this unhealthy side of aggressive, egocentric, domineering kinds of space. So... I'm extremely intrigued and excited to see if more integral kinds of ways of being take more root in society, because I don't see the system making it through without some major collapse unless we can move into that place where there is a space for people. Everybody has room to express and we have ways to hold all various forms of expression and we can encourage those healthy expressions rather than the pathological expressions. Yeah. And what I notice about pathology, I'll make one more point and then I'll pause. When we don't allow someone an expression and a voice, that to me is the ripest ground for pathology to emerge. It's like, F you know, I will talk, I will have a voice. And so I'm, I'm worried about this notion in society right now of shutting people down, not giving them a voice, rather than how do we encourage healthy expression of whatever they're trying to say, right? Mm. Yeah, I uh, I was just watching a little Star Trek last night, and uh, nice. Gene Roddenberry, the idea of the Federation of Planets and everybody working together, and I, I thought one of the brilliant things about that series and all of its TV shows is that all these different species come together, and there really is room for them to be themselves, right? Like, if William Riker wants to run around and, and sleep with different women, like, good for him, and if somebody else wants to focus on education like Captain Picard, then good for them, and everybody kind of gets to do their humanity the way they want to, but even in even in a universe like Star Trek where there seems to be encouragement for everybody to move that way, there's still Klingons and Romulans, sure. and, uh, and, they, and they still want to fight, and they, so yep. 
even as you move the world collectively to a better way of thinking about things, there's going to be people who are entrenching and see that shift as dangerous and want things to go back to the way they are. And, and violence will always be a part of that until you get everyone on board. And then, as I said, even if you get everyone on board, that may be more chaotic than, than only half of us on board. And who knows where that goes. There's a way to contain violence and violence is bad whenever it's unhealthy expressions of violence. Football is probably a pretty healthy expression of violence. And that's a way that we can contain red consciousness in a way yeah. that's healthy, right? There are ways to do all of these things. I think going back to what we were talking about before, didn't Gene Roddenberry, didn't he have some mystical experiences that gave rise to all of, I th- from what I understand, and I don't know if he did a psychedelic or something, but like, I once heard a story about him that it was this non-ordinary consciousness that gave him the vision of Star Trek and that we could start to see this. That's a lot of the potential of what we're talking about is that we see different, um, we see the world in much different vantage points. Yeah. And in the, I don't know that, but I know that he was a pioneer in being very inclusive and the way his story worked was to make room that each of these species valued each other for the gifts that they had. Women were on the same par as men. People of color were on the same par as those who are Caucasian. Uh, Alien species were given a fair shot to do things. And that is, that is pretty cool to know how early those kinds of thoughts were coming into his consciousness versus the collective consciousness of our, of our world. Um, Take us from take us from there to what happens next. I, I know that as you know, you and I were talking beforehand, and you sharing your outline that you furthered your education and and uh, really took on these kinds of concepts in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us about that. I got my master's degree in consciousness and transformative studies. I I'm just a consciousness geek. <laughs> I can't not. So I, I went and got a master's degree in this, and I. How old were you, by the way? Um, I started at like 30. I had to finish my undergrad. And I started at like early 30s, 33 or something. And then 30, no, 32. That's right. 31 or 32. And then I graduated with my master's when I was like 35. Man, yeah. That, That always impresses me when people a little later in life feel so passionate about something that they go back to school and, uh, and take on big things. And um, uh, anyway, I just want to say kudos to you. I've thought many times about going back to college and uh, never, never pulled the trigger to do Uh it. And uh, I'm, I honored uh, and proud of you for doing that. Thank you. Um, What did that give you? How did that increase (laughs) the tool bag that you had? Just expanded uh, the resources that I had expanded. Um, I got to study a lot of beautiful things. Um, the, the degree was sort of a triple Venn diagram of, we got to study a lot of the mystics, but we also got to study a lot of neuroscience as well as psychology. Mm. So it was a cool, it was a really cool degree. Um, but at the end of it, I realized it was intellectual and I had hired a coach for my own life and she was very much a proponent of embodiment work. And so at the end of my degree, I was quite intellectual. I was, a, I was, a, um, oh my gosh, what's the, the, um, uh, Spock, uh, Vulcan. I was a bit of a Vulcan, you know, like logic, <laughs> intellectual. And, um, so I dove into coaching work and embodiment work and I, I started to expand the space of my consciousness to realize that embodied consciousness and like the wisdom of the body is, uh, extremely valuable and needed. And part of the way we navigate, I don't think our intellects can navigate culture at large. I don't think our, our intellects can navigate relationships, trauma, wounding. It really takes people facilitating embodiment and the wisdom of the body to move through this. Mm. Our, our bodies have natural antibodies for things like trauma our minds don't. In, in fact, they're, they stand in stark contrast. When we get in those <clears throat> um, uh, 
um, thought loops when we perseverate on certain things. That is a huge sign that there are feelings we're not feeling and we're not allowing ourselves to feel. And so a lot of my work post grad school was to learn ways to integrate emotion and different energies in the body. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm sitting with that for a moment because I, I think there's a lot of truth there and I want to try to draw that out. Mm. Um, in this work of coaching people, because that's, that's where we're going. That's the, yeah. that's the practice you've taken on is to be a coach for others. And I'm just curious, like, um, I know that everybody's situation is unique and I know that each coach has their own focus in places. What are the, th what are the things you're trying to uh, flesh out? What are the things you're trying to help people discover or learn? What are you, what are the things you're tackling when you're working yeah. with people? I do a lot of men's work. Um, I also was in the military. I was in the National Guard um, and I got deployed to Afghanistan. So that was my early, early 20s. I was given this version of masculinity from both the church and the military. And it were these two different versions of pathological masculinity, right? The church was this subtle, insidious, manipulative kinds of, I mean, it is the, the patriarchy who leads the church and they don't give much voice to women. Hmm. The military was much more domineering. Like I got a bigger, bigger, you know, than you, like I'm just tougher. And yeah. it wasn't until I started doing men's work in my later thirties, after I left grad school, that I really was shown what healthy and conscious expressions of masculinity are. And I feel um, quite passionate about the feminine is on the rise. And if we as men and the masculine and all of us don't rise to meet and hold and encourage that, we're fucked. Yeah. So I feel very passionate about us men doing our work and that means higher EQ. That means more grounding. That means more uh, healthy expressions of a lot of the things we've been talking about. So a big part of my work is to work with men and do men's work. And it doesn't mean I don't work with women. I work with plenty of women as well. But in my group settings, I really love working with men. And <clears throat> the groups that I host are to support men through this transition out of the faith, out of the church because it's not easy. It is, it's not an easy transition to go from the world of Mormonism outside of the world of Mormonism. It's quite destabilizing. And I wish that I, I basically built what I wish I would have had in my twenties. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah. It, um, generally speaking, unhealthy systems create their own language. They create their own structures they make it so that seeing the world from a more collective outside view is going to be completely foreign to the way that you put things together. And so you're right. It's, it's a really difficult thing to traverse going from being an all in Latter-day Saint who knows that your authorities talk to God and everyone else is deceived um, to seeing uh, certain structures like patriarchy, where just because I have a penis, I'm the guy in charge in the room, right? And yep. and we defer our own um, inner decision making to the highest um, authority position in the room. So if it's the bishop in the room, and him and I disagree, he's right simply by the nature of his office. Good point. There is ways in which we're taught to distrust information simply because it wasn't written from inside the system versus outside. And it's a thousand other things. And as you point out, 
you don't even know it until you know it. And it often takes years and maybe even decades on the outside looking back to go, oh, I see, I see what was going on there. And I see that's not the way the world really works. Yeah. 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 Complicated stuff. Um, yeah. How long have you been doing the men's work? How long have you been doing this side of, you know, education and now like actually doing a practice essentially? Um, <clears throat> I dove in, let's see, I was the end of 2015 is when I, well, I started training, doing coaching training in 24, end of first 2015. Um, and then I dove really in. I'd worked with my teacher, John Wineland, who is a student of David Data, does a lot of relationship and intimacy and polarity work, does a lot of the masculine feminine work. And then I, like the next year, dove in and did traditional life coaching training. So I did two years of what would, what's called ontological coaching, mm. um, supporting people in their being. It was powerful work as well through accomplishment coaching. So with John, I'm sorry to, I could, I wish just give you an easy answer. It's just, yeah, yeah. it's a weird kind of muddled way in. I started taking like pro bono clients in 2016 and just kind of kept upping the, the space. So I've been doing it more or less for four or five years now, kind of. And I've led plenty of men's groups and helped people start them. And also worked a lot of one-on-one -on -one people that have left the church and that kind of thing. Yeah. What What else would you want to say about that? Like I'm, I'm deeply curious of what it actually looks like, like rubber meets the road when you're sitting down with a group of men uh, and trying to make it safe and to give encouragement for them to be in touch with the feminine. Yeah. Um, what does that look like? Because I'm a, I'm a big fan of all this stuff, by the way. I, I sit in – I don't do this specific thing, but – I sit around with friends and I'm deeply aware that say in a conversation, just one idea is that when you're in a conversation, men and women, because they've been taught they have to do it this way to gain any kind of standing, people tend to give deference to the masculine voices in the room. Totally. Yeah. And the feminine voices tend to be more reserved and draw back and don't get to say as much and aren't given as much value to the things that they're saying. Yeah. And it's only in the last couple of years that I've become uh, deeply aware that that's happening in a room and trying when I'm conscious enough of it to try and shift it or make it move. But we have whatever it is, thousands of years of evolutionary ingraining in us to preference our society this way. And, and then to add to it that men tend to signal to each other, if anybody does get emotional or if somebody does um, get in touch with their, their feminine side or, or their feminine voice, it, there is so much pressure in our society that goes like, well, uh -uh, mm -mm, don't do that. You're going to, you're embarrassing yourself. Yeah. And, and yet if we're really going to, it's, it's like, it's like the church when you have 15 white men in charge, old men, 15 old white men in charge, they're very, there's very deep blind spots that they don't, even comprehend. And same with what we're talking about. When masculine voices are given deep preference, there are deep blind spots in that collective conversation. And so I'm curious how you help these folks to feel safe and to feel encouraged um, to get in touch with that side of themselves. Yeah. Great question. You give men a tribe and you set the container to be a healthy expression of masculinity. Mm. It's an expression of, I challenge you, but I don't challenge you from a space of shame. I challenge you because I see the best in you, brother, and I love you. And I'm going to hold you in your shame, not to continue to shame you. It gives you a safe place of brothers that honor and welcome who you are. They honor and welcome your humanity. And while we might challenge you in one sense, we're also going to hold you in the other. So rubber meets the road. <clears throat> you know, a lot of times as I'm facilitating, I'll sit in front of the room. And, and the more trained you get, the more you can start to see people's shadow, mm. their blind spots. And that's the work as a coach in general. People show up and they have tons of blind spots. 
well, they can't, we can't see our own blind spots. I mean, they're blind to us. So the work is to basically show people their blind spots in a way that's like, this doesn't make you less valuable. It makes you more valuable. And it makes me like the level of trust for me to show you those, these blind spots and like all of your shame and darkness and underworld and all this kind of stuff. The more that I have the experience where I can show up to a group of powerful individuals and show those things and be loved for them and be accepted for them, the more I can show up to the world like that. Yeah. And that's the experience that we offer is you help guys see their blind spots. We help them see that stuff where um, once you can start to see it a little bit, you start to be able to integrate that. One of the things that I, f I feel very passionate about in integrating is, you know, a lot of times as I'm facilitating, I'll sit in the front of the room and sometimes people will throw their golden like shadows at me where he's powerful. He's this, he's that. And I feel strongly that the church gets that. And they're like, yes, I am. And my ego wants to do that for sure. But my job is to hold that projection for as short amount of time possible to where I can hand that projection back, where I can see that all the things you admire about me in the front of the room, are you admiring the, the are you, you have, let me say this, but I'm getting confused. All of the things that you admire about me, you're having a hard time seeing those attributes in yourself. And so the job is to help you pull back those golden shadows. It's to help you see your own voice, your own power. And so it's, it's the, those groups make room for everyone and their own brilliance and their own wisdom to show up. And that's the power of this work is to be around a bunch of powerful men who you admire and respect, who feel the same way about you. I hope that I feel like I wasn't very clear. Like, I hope it was, it wasn't as clunky as it maybe sounded in my own head. No, no, no. I, I think <laughs> okay. that's good. I Great. think that we're all different. We all have different personalities. We all have different leanings here or there. I've, I've got a really good friend. Uh, and he's actually still a believing member of the church to some degree. And he has a much stronger feminine side than I do. And yet he is, um, he also embodies a very healthy masculinity. And um, it's, it's interesting to see him, his dynamic at work, because it's very different from mine. And yet I'm deeply appreciative of the gifts he brings to the table even though he doesn't do life the way I do it. And I think when you get a group of people together where you can value each other in your differences, make it safe to explore who you are and the pieces that you have felt shame over. Cause at the end of the day, shame is such a, I, I don't want to say it's entirely negative. Cause I think on some level, there is some degree of shame for things that maybe keeps us from doing really unhealthy stuff. Right. Good point. Yep. But generally speaking, when your humanity shows up in a way that society isn't okay with, and yet you're causing no one any harm, you're not hurting anybody, you're just being the version of you, which is entirely different from the other 8 billion people on the planet, people shouldn't be feeling shame for showing up as their authentic self when that authentic self isn't malicious or causing people harm. And so to help people discard that shame, to set it off to the side, to cast it off, and to be able to show up as their real authentic self, I can't think of a better work than that. So I think you described it well. I don't think it was clunky right. at all. Um, do, is is your work all done locally? Now you live you live in Vegas, the Vegas I'm area, Salt, correct? No, I'm in Salt Lake. Well, oh, you're in Salt Lake. I didn't yep. know that. <laughs> yep. Um, is most of your work local? Do do you take on nope. people like Skype and Zoom and that kind yep. of stuff too? Yep. Yeah. My one-on-one -on -one clientele, people coming to me for a lot of more traditional kinds of coaching uh, desires. I want to build a business. I want to get better in my business. I want to get into relationship. I want to whatever. Yeah. People have various things. So, so I, I work with people from all over one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So I have clients all over the States and even different countries. 
the groups we've been, I lead with um, a dear friend of mine. His name is Andrew Jolly. He's a powerful, brilliant um, individual. We've been leading these groups locally in Salt Lake. I'm not attached to that. I would happily travel if we had enough that a group wanted to meet and wherever. Um, but a lot of the group work I have done in Salt Lake, I lived in the Bay area, um, during my, during grad school. And I was there most of my thirties. And I moved back to Utah in hopes of supporting health, healthy cultural change here in Utah. So I want to offer more things in Utah that give a greater degree of expression. And so yeah. not, a, not opposed to leading stuff outside, but I, I love actually leading things here in Salt Lake. Yeah. Uh, for people who are listening, obviously a, a large chunk of the listeners of this episode will be in that Northern Utah area. Um, for people who want to reach out to you to see if there's something that they might be able to take advantage of, what, uh, where can we point people to? Great. You can go to my website, jaredandersoncoaching.com, J-A-R-E-D, and then Anderson with an O. You could also just email me, uh, jared at jaredandersoncoaching.com. Um, happily respond. And uh, I'm working on, we just finished, Andrew and I just finished our first, not our first, Our we just did like four groups last year. And so they were phenomenal. We had such a beautiful time with that. Um, and, um, I don't have dates right now, but it's, it's coming soon for the next groups to start. So reach out to me and I will happily give you, uh, all the information you need and you can get on to, you know, just a mailing list and love to keep in contact with you. Yeah. And I will, um, I'll include the links that you've said and I'll put your email in, uh, in the episode notes and that way people can reach out to you. Um, I think you're doing a phenomenal work. I'm, I'm, I'm a familiar with Andrew. I, you know, I know that uh, several people that you work with are friends of mine and uh, I think you're doing a great work to help people kind of process the leaving of an unhealthy system and feel the encouragement to grab on to a better way to do things. And and I just, I'm just super proud of the work you do. Uh well, thank you very much. Yeah, I, I hear yeah. that, and I, I appreciate the kind words. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to say about uh, your work? Anything else you want to plug? Um, or any final words you've got before we kind of wrap this up? I lead authentic relating games. These games are fun. They're cheap. They're like, you know, they're great. And I lead them once a month here in Salt Lake, as well as online. Um, the first Saturday and Sunday, the Saturday I do the in-person Sunday, I do the online. These are really beautiful embodiment kinds of place, uh, uh, practices, and they're really fun and they're challenging and they really, yeah. So if you're interested in authentic, like authenticity and embodiment work, reach out about those games. I'd love to have you there. Um, and they're, they're great. Just, yeah, come on down for those as well. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Love it. Um, I would deeply encourage if anybody felt that little poke during this conversation that you want to explore these things more, um, the the sources of information that we shared, Alan Watts and uh, Ken Wilbur, uh, James Fowler's Stages of Faith for me was a early one. I don't know that I would find it as interesting today because yeah. I think there's a lot more stuff uh, that isn't covered by that. But Wilbur and Alan Watts, um, and also please do check out Jared Anderson's uh, website and, and see what he's offering. I was just looking over to the to my left and looking at your website, clicking the button offerings and seeing what you've got on there. There's a lot of cool stuff. So um, I, I just, again, really appreciate the your time this morning, Jared. And uh, I, I really want to help people. I really want to help people feel the strength to be the authentic version of their humanity mm. without feeling the shame and coercion that society is constantly adding. Yeah. And you're doing a great job at uh, bringing that to pass. So thank you. I appreciate those words. And I want to throw you some praise as well, because I think that your work is, is uh, your brilliance and the, the dedication you have to 
highlighting information and showing the subtle nuance of what's happening, I think is brilliant scholarship and it's important and very needed. So I, we just got to know each other. I hope our relationship continues because I'd love to get to know you more because all I've seen is you from afar and the scholarship that you've done. Extremely important information and uh, you bring humor to it. And there's, there's, I love, you know, your memes and all the kind of work you put into it. And I think it's beautiful. And so thank you for doing that work. It's, it's, um, it's extremely needed and valuable. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, check it out. Jared Anderson coaching.com. Like you said, it's J A R E D A N D E R S O N C O A C H I N G.com. And I'll put your email again, but would you say it one more time? Your email address? Just Jared at Jared Anderson coaching.com. Perfect. Yep. And uh, again, appreciate your time this morning and uh, you, I'll put this up uh, here in a few minutes and people can start to enjoy this conversation. I thought we covered a lot of good ground. Yeah. Yeah, we, we did. We covered a lot. That was a lot of fun. Good. Yeah. Good. Have an awesome day. And uh, people, if you have any questions at all, reach out to Jared and uh, just excited uh, to be publishing content for the Mormon Discussion Podcast again now that I've got Love a little it. more free time. So it's exciting. Uh, keep me in the loop, Jared. If you're ever doing anything that I can help with, okay. if you ever want to put a group together down here in Southern Utah, I'd be happy to try to help facilitate that. I'm a big fan of men's work. Would love to support somebody in setting that up. So Yeah, yeah. love it. Love it. Thanks awesome. so much, Bill. It's a lot of fun. I really appreciate you having me on. Okay. Have a great day, my friend. Beautiful. Okay. Bye-bye.